we've created this society where scale is how you have to go instead of just living your life. One of my favorite taglines the entire podcast is everybody builds a business and then builds a lifestyle around it instead of building the lifestyle and building a business around it. Because at the end of the day, if you're making $6,000 a month and you're okay with it and you get to own your time and you get to own your freedom, the only reason you would scale away from that is your own ego. At the end of the day, nobody wants to take the steps necessary anymore. Nobody wants to work on their life and especially high performers, guys that are making money, they only seek me when they have a nine car pileup. When they're like, oh, wait, my wife says I'm a horrible husband and my kids hate my guts. What happened? I thought I was doing everything I should be doing. No, they don't care. You're the only one that cares because you're trying to prove to Frank that you're better than him. When the people that are closest to you get the shrapnel. Welcome everyone to the Cassandra Properties Podcast. We're joined today by Austin Linney. This is going to be a pretty honest, raw discussion. I've been looking forward to this one for a number of reasons. We have Rebecca joining us also. As many of you know, uh, Rebecca is in the process of becoming a certified coach uh, for the agents here at the office. And uh, Austin has a, a pretty wow. amazing story. Uh, mindset coach, business coach, you know, serial entrepreneur, all the things that you kind of, you know, here over and over on this, this show, uh, we all seem to be cut from the same cloth in one way or another, you know, but we wanted to really take a, a dive into Austin's past and how he got where he is, I think, to just kind of soften the audience up and, and get them uh, in the mindset of understanding that, you know, we're all kind of in the same, same boat, we all kind of got here and in, in our own path, but they're, they're very similar. And then quite honestly, dive into like, what's the most important thing in the world is just the eight inches between your ears. And in business, how, you know, we're all running around trying new systems and new softwares and new ways of doing things. And if you don't get your mindset right, it, none of it matters. So Austin, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Really looking forward to the chat. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Beck, you want to kick things off today? Sure. Yeah. So Austin, tell us a little bit about yourself. I believe you said you live in Texas now, but have you always lived there? Yeah. Uh, Nashville, Denver, Texas. We're moving to, I just found out two days ago, I'm moving to Tahoe in five weeks. So that oh, happened. Wow. So uh, yeah, we travel a bunch. So really home base is secondary to me. It's not, it doesn't really exist. It's, it's just a, a place this will be a little more home based than normal but but yeah i'm uh we've been in i'm in georgetown texas which is north of austin we've been here for about a year so uh i was in arizona briefly last summer maybe you could share with the audience uh, a little bit about your journey you know sure. I, I listen to your podcast i think it's awesome i love your rants mm -hmm. uh, you know but i want to share with the audience a little bit about your background if that's cool just so that of course you get a sense of you know they're talking to a real guy who's traveled a real path yeah, I mean, it, it's really summed up pretty quickly. It's the same way I meet most people when I'm at a networking event. Uh, you know, meth addict, cocaine addict, uh, homeless, and an alcoholic, you know? And I kind of just get it out of the way right there, and they kind of understand that that uh, I've lived it and, and recently divorced, too, and laid off, you know, from private equity. So I've covered the gamut. I've blown up my life about seven times. Uh, but, you know, in my early 20s, uh, I worked in the hospitality business, uh, for about 20 years, most of my life. And, and, and back in the day the you know, the hospitality business was what it was. I mean, it was very laden with alcohol and, and drug addiction. And, um, you know, when I was 17, my, my parents got divorced. Um, and it was kind of threw me for a loop. I somehow through miscommunication through my own doing kind of blame myself for my parents' divorce. Um, and kind of carried that cross for about 20 years until I finally, started getting some help. Um, but, you know, kind of went down some, some rough paths. You know, I, um, the, the thing about drugs is, is that the, the Friday turns into Saturday and then it's just Friday, Saturday, and then it's Monday, Tuesday, and then it's Wednesday. And then it just kind of like spirals out of control. And then you dive into what I proceeded to be victimhood for, you know, the better part of 20 years and, and blaming the, you know, it's the world's problem. It's, my mom's problem is my dad's problem. And, um, through, you know, the, one of the worst times for me was I was, I stayed up for like eight days straight. Um, 
and I lost like 25 pounds and I was just not in a good place anymore and didn't really eat. And I had an ex-girlfriend who saw me and she was just like, you know, this isn't you. I don't, I don't really know what's going on, but you need to get it together. And so I, I, I drove home and I packed up all my stuff and I, I moved to Austin the first time. And, you know, I, the weird thing about me is that regardless of how bad it's going, when I make a decision, it's done. Like I have a really mil military mind. So I was done with the hard drugs. Now, you know, alcohol is very accepted in society. Plus I was a high end bartender. Plus I sold wine. So it's kind of like you kind of get, and so you, you drink and, and I drank and it was never, not all the time it was out of control, but I definitely drank, uh, you know, what I would consider a functioning alcoholic for the better part of 20 years. Um, I've been sober for two years and five months. Um, I've lost, thank you. I've lost 70 pounds. Um, so it's been a 180 and I have, you know, a lot of people to thank for that. Mainly when I decided to stop feed my own BS to myself and, and, and took extreme ownership. But, but, uh, I joined a mastermind and, uh, I know this is like the most odd statement I ever say on a podcast, but it's, it's the truth. Uh, I started a business with two gentlemen that were 37 and 38 and they were nine months and a year and a half sober. And it was the first time I've ever been around successful men that were sober. And I know that sounds so crazy to say, but it was the first time I saw that it was possible and they said to me a simple thing. If you've ever thought of stopping for a little bit, try it. And that was kind of the genesis behind trying to get sober. And I, I stopped for 27 days and started up again and got upset. And then I waited 30 days and then went for it again and got to 60 days and got to six months and it was feeling so good. I was like, what if I did this for a year? And then the year turned into two years and now here we are. So it's really yeah. crazy. Look, if, if, if you're not going to be honest and open up, man, we're not going to do this <laughs> shit today. Hey, I, I kept it. I kept it. I kept it pretty light there, dude. <laughs> uh, that's but, awesome. uh, congratulations. I mean, it's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. you, you're right. Uh, you, many times um, high performing individuals have this other side. And it's very difficult to turn off the other side, right? You know, you're going, you're working, you're hammering 80, 100, 120 hours a week. And, you know, when you call it a day, it just doesn't, you know, the switch doesn't flip. Uh, you know, I was talking, I talked a lot about this with the former president, not defending, not defending, just the statement. You know, people didn't understand why does he have to go so far and why does that's, you get what you see is what you get. That's all day, every day. It's go, 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 kill, kill, kill. And it's really hard to get to a place where you find that balance. And it's something that um, being candid, we've talked about this a little bit on the show. You know, uh, I've been pedaling the bike and fixing the bike for so long that you kind of fall into these habits at work where you, you don't recognize, you don't even recognize there's another way, right? It's just, this is what you do. And and whatever it is, it is. And you, you're kind of going through the path. And um, one of the younger agents here, really rock star agent, Rob Nixon, um, you know, we were having a tough time communicating like two years ago. And uh, millennial, I'm 46. You know, I kind of did things one way. He wanted to do things a completely different way. And, you know, I just kind of had the mindset of like, look, it's working. You know, like, come on, get on board. Let's go. And, you know, he had the mindset of, yeah, but could be working a little bit better. No. And, you know, that's tough to hear. Right. You, you have some measure of success and you're hustling and you're working hard. And, you know, here comes a young guy along. Uh, and then, you know, it started to happen with another younger agent. And I started to say, you know what, maybe there is a, a different different way to do this. So they convinced me to go to this uh, communication boot camp with a business coach. And I was like, you know what, I'll go. It's a Saturday, whatever. And um, I didn't think I would take a single thing from it. And like 10 minutes in, my mind just started to get blown. Like, oh, my God, like <laughs> I have screwed everything up. <laughs> like there, there, there is another way. And, you know, we started down this path of of coaching um, yep. and trying to get 
much better, much more efficient. And, uh, you know, it's been really productive, but I think someplace where I could use a lot of help. And I think a lot of the listeners out there that, you know, are in a similar place where, you know, you, you blink and 20 years comes off the calendar and you're just hustling yourself to death is the life coaching thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, could you talk a little bit about the difference between sure. business coach and life coach? Sure. Uh, one thing in the communication sector, my favorite quote, it's one sentence. It's one of the most powerful sentences I've ever heard in my life. George Bernard Shaw says, the problem with communication is the illusion that it's taken place. Mm. Mm. So what's interesting is I actually can't stand the, uh, the label life coach uh, cause it makes me sound like I smoke weed and wear flip-flops all day. So, but I digress. So I try to, I try to stick in the mindset coach area. Uh, but, but either way, it doesn't matter because typically what that am, because you know, what's interesting about, about people, right. Is that people, two things are happening. Something we talked about on my podcast about somebody, um, they're walking around living injected values of other people. They don't even know what their values are. And the second thing is they're being triggered by emotions that drive their goals, right? Because I'll, I'll be 100% honest. I think goals are BS. I think they're stupid. I could, if you had 20 people in front of me, your agents, if you had 20 people in front of me, I would look through their goals and I would tell you that 90% of those goals will be for somebody else. They don't really want that because we've created this society where scale is how you have to go instead of just living your life. Like one of my favorite taglines, the entire podcast is everybody builds a business and then builds a lifestyle around it instead of building the lifestyle and building a business around it. Because at the end of the day, if you're making $6,000 a month and you're okay with it and you get to own your time and you get to own your freedom, the only reason you would scale away from that is your own ego. And so at the end of the day, nobody wants to take the steps necessary anymore. Nobody wants to work on their life, and especially high performers, guys that are making money. They only seek me when they have a nine car pileup, when they're like, oh, wait, my wife says I'm a horrible husband and my kids hate my guts. What happened? I thought I was doing everything I should be doing. No, they don't care. You're the only one that cares because you're trying to prove to Frank that you're better than him when the people that are closest to you get the shrapnel. Right. And, and so we have to make sure that we are taking the time necessary. What I call it is putting an armor on in the morning. That's for you. Like, are you taking the time necessary? And for me, so, um, Last was it? Yeah, last year in October, I was I, I was doing good, but I wasn't like where I wanted to be. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I'm just gonna like take it up a notch. Like I'm just gonna see if I can. I always like to press my mind, and I started doing 75 hard, which is an Andy Frisella thing where you work out twice a day, you drink a gallon of water, no alcohol, no cheat meals, um, 10 pages a day. Well, I did it for 150 days straight. <laughs> I was only supposed to do it for 75 wow. because I was like, you know what? I feel so good. Like, why would I run away from this? Right. And then what it does when you push yourself like that, you set a new standard that you can't go back from. And so when you set a new standard, you've already reached another level. Right. But the people that are out there performing, the agents that are performing, let's be honest, guys, the market is playing. I coach a lot of agents. The, the market is making them better than they seem. When sure. typically the market, right? And so, you know what, who the hardest people to coach in the world right now are? Agents. Because they think, they think they're hot to try right now. Yep. And when, and then when this thing goes south, they're going to be like, does. they're going to be like, oh, well, wait, where's my sales? Where's my, because here's the deal. I got an agent right now in Dallas who closed 130 transactions by herself last year. Who are you? Like, she's crushing it. Like, so... And, and one, of the, one of my favorite quotes ever is Ed Milet spoke to my mentors group, which is GoBundance. And he was on a stage full of 50 millionaires and he looked them dead in the face and he said, yeah, all y'all are doing great compared to who? Not compared to me. And yeah. so there's always another level. And so we get in these comfort zone, what I call stuck neutral. We get in that stuck neutral with our relationships, with our spouse, with our kids, with our all these things, because we're 
we're so worried about what we're getting out of it instead of opening our ears and asking them what they need out of it instead of just moving forward, what I call being a bulldozer. So, you know, so many of us, like you said, you, you don't hear from us until we're, we're in the nine car pile up. Right. So those of us that have taken some steps and, and I think self-awareness is the number one thing, at least for me, Mm -hmm. Self-awareness was uh, so far the most difficult part of it, just really being honest with myself about mm -hmm. who am I, what do I want, where do I want to go, um, you know, and that that starts to open like a lot of doors and it starts to open up a lot of thoughts from the past and a lot of, you know, that's a that's a rough patch. Right. And it's a rough patch that I'm still going through. Right. I'm exploring a lot of different things, trying to figure out you know, how exactly did I get here? Like, you know, literally 20 years went boom. And it's like, wow. You know, we, like I said, we've had some success, but not nearly the success I think we're capable of. I know we're capable of, uh, and you just fall into these patterns. So before you get to the nine car pile up, right. How do you peel the onion back enough to, to get to the point where you recognize the issue or that there even is an issue, right? How do you, how do you get there? I think the it most an accident for me. So. Yeah. I think the most important thing that uh, people don't ask themselves is how are you speaking to yourself? Like, how are you speaking to yourself? Right. And, and you know, what's interesting is like when I started to change, I didn't believe that I was capable of what I was, but I had people around me that believed I was, there was more in me. And I hung on to their belief until my belief caught up with it. And so I would imagine that that, like you said, that that eight inches between your head is probably having that negative cycle of, of coaching. And, you know, like your gut is oh, telling yeah. you like, hey, man, something doesn't feel right. And more importantly, like what I always suggest and my friends have no problem doing this is go up to somebody that you really respect and be like, hey, um, have I been like, what's really odd, right. Is when I stopped drinking, like I had like three buddies, like come up to me and they're like, Hey man, thank you. <laughs> like it was getting a little out of control and you're like, Whoa, shit. Like, cause you're so, one of my favorite things is this uh, guy was talking on Tom Blues and he said, if you didn't brush your teeth for three days, you personally wouldn't know, but everybody around you would know it. And so that's kind of like life, you know, we're walking around, we're, we're doing what we think is right. And more importantly, here's the issue, because I, I, I see where you're coming from. The bigger issue is, is, the, is the business owner, right, who has the vision, who's pushing forward, who thinks he's doing right by his troops. But what he's doing is he's stifling growth and creativity within his group, not on purpose, but with his actions and what that does is the only currency that matters to anybody in this world moving forward is, are they growing? If you do not allow them the space necessary to grow, they will leave because you make them feel like they don't have a chance. And so when you're just sitting there and let's say you made a hundred K, let's just say you made a hundred K as an agent and you made a hundred K again and you made it again. And you're like, that's a good life, but are you happy, right? And so you have to really get in there and get people that are going to give you some proper feedback. You're going to have, you can't have any attachment to it because they're just being, they're, they're just being concerned for you. And then you have to look at it with a lens, right? The number one thing that I work on is having attachment and expect expectations to anything, because you're right. The, the only thing that really matters is self-awareness. Nobody's perfect. But if you're always fixing, you know, one of the, our things on the podcast is 1% a day. Are you getting 1% better a day? That's all you can do. And if you combine those things over and over again, it's going to get you to where you want to go. But it's the people that are trying to force the growth. They're trying to force all this stuff instead of actually putting in the work. So... It, 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 it just, it sounds easier than it is because in the moment you don't recognize these things, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, Austin, do, does it, does it require that, that pile up? You know, did you have to hit 
rock bottom to recognize that you wanted to make the change? I mean, do, do, do you have to go down that, you know, tragic path that some of us don't come back from, to be perfectly candid? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, how, how do you how do you get to that place where at least you know enough to say, I've got to take a step back and go find a mindset coach and, and work on some things to try and change where I'm going and what I'm doing? Because you are performing high, you know. You, you're, you are making good money. You are, you think living the life you, you, you think your family loves you. You think everything is great and it's just not right. You know, those, you know, those rants that you said you like, you know, yeah. you know, you, you know, who you know who those are too. They're to my younger self. Hmm. That's where those rants come from because I'm trying to get the message out there that you don't have to go through the divorce. Like I did. You don't, have to get laid off. You don't have to lose $26,000 in a business because your ego is fucking up. You don't have to be a, a drunk for 20 years because I'm trying to talk and speak wisdom because at our core, we do know that we can be better. And so it takes you what I call the spoke in the wheel. The wheel's rolling. You got to, somebody's got to stick the stick in it, whether it's your wife saying she's going to leave you, whether it's your kids saying, dad, you're not present. All these things, they got to sham stick. Something's got to happen. Something's got to shake you loose because we shouldn't, you know, Anthony, my other podcast, some other things said, we shouldn't have to get to DEF CON 10 for, for us to make a change, but that's how we do it. And so I would hope that something, some word, some sentence, some book, would hit the switch and let you know that maybe it's time because that's not what we're taught. We're taught that we got to push, 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 push. And I'm just as guilty of it. Right. I've got, you know, multiple businesses going on, multiple podcasts, coaching business. But what I'm realizing is what I've done is I front load my week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday is kind of, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are super busy. And then Friday, nothing scheduled. Like if I go golfing with an investor or I have some phone calls with some friends and I just leave it because, you, you know, you might need to do something. But I'm teaching myself that there's a time to be super intense. There's a time to work and, and do all these things. But there's also a time. And, and don't get me wrong. <laughs> it's so hard because I want to just keep slamming the throttle. But I but then you're not showing up. When it's game time, you're not showing up rested, refreshed, and ready, right? Because a lot of people equate time in the saddle as work instead of intentional time in the saddle. Like, is your hours really potent or are you just working to make yourself feel better on the back end like you were working? Yeah. And I think that's something we talk about all the time, James, you and I, about, you know, are we is are we being effective with our time and intentional with it and it's really hard when you get down to it to to figure it out and to kind of map out your schedule in a way that it makes sense and you do carve out that time for yourself to refresh because you're right everybody needs that that downtime otherwise you're just you're exhausted and you can't think straight mm -hmm. what do you and I don't mean to turn it around on, on, on you, Rebecca, but what do you think is the hardest thing about that? About, about, about taking the time. About taking the time. I think that for us, a lot of it is we don't want to miss the, a good opportunity. So when it comes up, it's like, well, this looks so good. We got to take it. We got to jump on it instead of sitting back and saying, this might be a good opportunity, but it might not be the one we should um, get involved in right now. So there's a guy named Aaron Wagner. He's a big commercial dude. He owns a bunch of private funds. He uh, was very intrigued by the Rockefellers and all the rich families of America. And the only family that was still making money in the fourth generation was the Rockefellers. So he interviewed all the families. He said, what did your grandfather do that taught y'all to continue to make money in the fourth generation? And he said, my grandfather taught me to sell early. And he was like, what? Mm -hmm. And he said, because my grandfather taught me that the best deal of my life came every week. And if I hold on too long and lose money, it's going to push me back two years. But if I sold before I was ready, I collected the cash and I kept buying more deals, then I would continue to make money. And so every week is the best deal of his life. 
abundant mentality. And that's a hard business when the real estate market is compressed as it is right now. But you might make as much money on the deal that you don't buy than the one you do buy. Yeah. So it's a challenge because you, it's hard to quantify this, but you, 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 you go out, you hustle, you bust hump, and then you kind of just arrive. Nobody says you've arrived. You, mm-hmm. There's no like, Hey, this is it. You know, you just kind of get there. And when you get there, doors open, right. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the doors start opening and, it's like, wow, th- th- this is it. This is what I've been working for. And it's it's tough to, you know, decide which doors to go through, if at all, uh, mm-hmm. because you, you can really quickly get burned out and, and diluted. And, you know, if those doors open, which is what happened to me, the doors open for me before I recognized that I had to start reevaluating things. So as the doors were opening, I was still in just go mode. And I had, you know, as you were saying, the moment I had that moment for me. And uh, at that point, when I had the moment, I went, oh, fuck, you know, and now I'm like, uh, okay, I've got a lot of commitments and I'm, I'm involved in a lot of things and I'll see them through to a point um, and make sure that the situation's better when I exit than it was when I got there. But I can't possibly carry all of these things forward, right? It just became way too much. Uh, you know, when I, I got more into the coaching um, and one of the exercises, and I may have shared this at one point or, or another, I'm not sure. Uh, it, my wife, well, they asked us to, you know, kind of fill out like these questionnaires about time off. And, you know, it was, what was, uh, when's the last full day off where no phone, like it was just, you were off. <laughs> and I can laugh about it now, but I wasn't laughing then. And she wrote, you know, um, he has never had a day off, including our wedding day when he had meetings. Now, I've been married for 13 years, 14 years. Mm-hmm. And it was like, I swear to God, I didn't see it. It That just didn't register for me. It was like, that. That if, if I would have read that somewhere, I would have been like, who's that asshole, right? That can't be possible. But that's what it was. And, and I, that for me, and that wasn't too, too long ago was the, all right, we got to clean things up. We need to kind of step back a bit and pick a path and pick the place we want to go. You know, Mm -hmm. what stuck with me a lot that you said earlier was goals that so many of the goals you write are not your goals. They're things that one way or another have been imprinted on you and, You know, you believe that this is something you have to do for someone else. Um, And as you go through that process, it that's just wicked hard as you start to look at that stuff and go, I don't even want to be doing some of the stuff that I'm doing. And I don't have to because I'm recognizing what my gift is now. And when I'm in my gift, I absolutely love it. And when I'm not now that I'm aware of it, I'm miserable. Like, I don't want to do some of the other things that I was doing. Entrepreneurship is basically walking out on the edge of a tree limb, getting to the end and going, what the fuck am I doing here? That's what entrepreneurship is. And the issue is, is that we're out on the edge of that tree limb and we're acting like we don't have a choice. That's the rub. Look, Aubrey Marcus said it on Ed Milet's podcast. You could not eat for five days and you would die, but it's still a choice. He said, the problem with everybody is we're walking around like we don't have a choice in the matter. Like we have to, because those goals that you have written down are for your dad, for your mom, for your brother, for your ex-wife, for your spouse, for your friends. And here it is. And this is the rub. That's the scariest. As an owner of a company, you have people that look up to you. And that's the true thing that's hitting your heart. But that's also on you to determine how many people you need in your thing, right? Look, the most interesting game to me in the entire real estate space is the wholesaler game, right? I coach some. I know the insides of businesses. I've seen it. All my friends are the best role wholesalers in Arizona. And you've got guys that are say, yeah, I'm bringing in 400K a month. And their their overhead is, you know, 350, right? Okay, great. You're bringing in 50. Well, then you have my buddy who's going to do a million net this year and their, and their overhead is three, three K a month, but people are telling him he needs to do more. 
because it doesn't right. look right that way on the surface, right? right? Yep. Whatever, dude. Screw you. <laughs> like, it, like, but, but that's not what the that's not what society tells them, right? They they gotta they gotta push, push, push. Yeah, you gotta push. But the problem is, if the machine turns off, you're left holding the bag, right? Yeah, no doubt. In perfect example, we and I didn't even know this. Okay, I I didn't even know this. A friend of mine, I'm not gonna say names, but he's a big apartment guy, and he was deep into uh, arbitrage Airbnb when COVID hit. Dude, they had 30 leases. He had to write a check for $80,000 to get out of them all. That's what they don't talk about. Yeah. Like, and, and not that he wasn't making money before, but that happens and it happens, it happens so quick. And when you're overhead or you're stretching or you're, you know, like you have to be really careful because, you know, I do Airbnb. That's my thing. And I, along with construction and development. But what people don't understand is when you take, when you go from three Airbnbs to let's say like seven or like eight, it's like going from like 10 units to like 90 units. It's not like, so like the question is, is yeah, you might make an extra 2000 bucks, but what does it do to your lifestyle, right? On the back of that, I interviewed a guy the other day who's 26 years old, him and his wife left both of their corporate jobs. They have three Airbnbs and they net cash flow 26K last month. They're in a van traveling around the country. Does he need overhead? Does he need the other stuff? Should he, should he grow his business? Like these are the conversations that are being had. The conversation is no. Well, what does it look like on paper? What does your brokerage do? Well, no. What is your brokerage net? Yeah. That's what matters. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, you know, as you come through the ranks and we're, we're just in a, a place in time where it's amazing that we have access to these tools, right? Without a podcast world and without the ability to, you know, Elon Musk taught himself how to launch rockets up to Mars, like literally through YouTube, right? So we have those tools available to us now, uh, whereas in the past we didn't. And it's very, very, very easy. And I mean, folks, very easy to look to the past that people have had success in an industry and just emulate what they did, right? Because, well, they had 100 agents or they had 200 agents, they had 300 agents, it must work. Not necessarily the case. The game has changed so fast and there are so many different tools available now that um, I think it's imperative to kind of break those chains and and look for a different way to do things. But with that also comes that pressure of there's always a new tool available, right? There's always something in real estate. There's always a new tech. There's always a new site. There's always a new gimmick. There's always a new something that you, you, you're you tempted to invest in because you, you care, right? You want to do the best job for your clients. You want to do the best thing job for your people. But then you wake up and you've got a, a machine that costs 700000 a year to run. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's heavy, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of weight. It's very, very challenging to pull back from that stuff and start saying, yeah, no, you know, I, I, I used to say this and I stopped saying it because people took it the wrong way. You know, you could put me on a milk crate in a closet in the middle of Utah. You give me a phone, I'm going to make money. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I know how to make deals. I'll go. I don't need any of this mess that we have around us today. Mm -hmm. um, but you fall into that pattern and, and yep. everybody's got access to something. Everyone's got a suggestion. And like you said, your goals all of a sudden are not your goals and you're building companies that you really don't want to build. And even if, you know, profits, one thing, and that's great, but that doesn't translate to happiness, right? Sure. You know, you could be making a lot of money and, not be the happiest person, you know, going. So it, it's really tough to, to, to find that balance and, and get that level of awareness and then to start to selectively pull things back and get where you want to be. And, and, you know, we're not getting any younger, right? Every day is another day off the calendar and it's like, shit, I'm 46 years old. And I said this when I was 25, I didn't know anything when I was 20. And at 30, I didn't know anything when I was 25. And you just keep, <laughs> you keep doing that, yeah. right? And I'm, I'm kind of at a point now where I'm like, I, I want to know, 
You know, I don't want to know anymore. Like I want to be, I want to arrive there and, and now I've got my knowledge and I want to go forward. And cause it, it does get exhausting, man. It's constantly evolving. It's constantly adapting, pivoting. It's a lot of energy. The two segments of people I worry about the most are teachers and real estate agents. They're the, they're the two segments of society that take care of themselves the least. And really? it, scare, it scares me to death. Yeah. There's so many teachers out there that have no boundaries. They, yeah. they, they're, they're, they're so worried about their students. Real estate agents the same way. You know how many young real estate agents I coach who are run through the, you know, run through the mill by their clients like that, that, that can't have a life. They're working on Saturdays, Sundays, they're, they're just trying to make a deal and they're not working out. They're eating bad. They're not, you know, it's like, it's such a hard, because you're so at the whim of your client. Like, it's just this like constant. And I, and I worry about them because if you're not taking care of yourself, if you're not doing something for yourself every day. And, and one of the things I teach my clients, I had a new, new coaching client today. Cause I'm a, like networking is my jam. Like that's my, like we're writing a book about it right now. Like that's my superpowers is like super, super connecting. And what I tell everybody is like uh, networking is like, uh, is like a baseball team. You got to have your people, but you don't need to get them all at once. Right. And so I tell my clients, like if your goal for the week, right, like your habit or your goal is to meet five people. If you meet those five people on Monday afternoon, you're done for the week. We, we think that we have to have this constant, you know, well, I need to meet everybody. I need to meet, no, no, no. If you're going to an event, maybe you need to meet three people or you know the three people you want to meet, meet them, walk out. Like, that's it. But we don't put anything written down. And so we just keep bringing more. It's like, it's like, it's like if you never felt full, you're just like eating and eating and eating. And so what I try to do is I adopted this thing called winning the day. What are the five things I can do every day that once I do that, I win the day. Those aren't goals, they're habits. And if I do those five things, then I can know that my day's done. And if your day, if that, if you do that at 11, you do it at 11. If you do it at one or six at night, you're just creating this like stop gap where you're like, okay, I can like, this whole game is just hacking your mind. Okay. I got a coach. I got a coaching client building a huge business right now. He hates busy work. I mean, like, hates it. Like it's really affecting their company. And I said, dude, you're making it too hard on yourself. I said, what do you like? You like football? I love football. I used to be, I used to be a coach. Awesome. Turn on football or the office and do your busy work. Really? That's it. Yeah. Well, he turned it on. He's happy because the football game's on and he got all his work done. You have to figure out little ways to trick your mind to like do stuff. Like, and for me, I'm a morning guy. If I don't get my workouts in in the morning, if I don't do my stuff in the morning, my day gets away from me. I'm not as put together mentally after like four o'clock. So I don't schedule any meetings past four o'clock because I know that I don't want to do that. And so I'd rather start my day early because it's, it's a proven fact that you have more beta waves and more focus energy in the morning. So I get all the hard stuff done in the morning and the afternoons more for conversations, real estate transactions, stuff that's just mindless work. But you have to know that about yourself. And then on the back of that, you have to outsource what you're not good at. And that's one of the things that I, like my podcast, I don't know what's going on. I do this <laughs> thing, I record it, it drops in a Dropbox file, everybody else handles it. If I, if I had to do that, there'd be no podcast produced. You know, you just have to, you have to understand what you're good. And that just takes, it takes a little time, but just, just when, and then when you, when those things are left, then you feel lighter. You feel like you can operate in the, in the aspects that are true to you. So Becca, I think it's become pretty clear what the problem is. It's you. I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. You <laughs> gotta stop waiting. making shit constantly. <laughs> I was waiting for it. You're the problem. Uh, Okay, Thanks, yep. mm-hmm. What what did I do? I took a fuse. <laughs> and we're done now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So you are involved in transactional real estate also, correct? So yeah, I ran an Airbnb management company for the last five years. We ran it at scale for a long time. I, when COVID hit, we kind of pulled pulled it back and decided we're only gonna do luxury properties. 
but but what I've had my eye on and what we're working on currently, and uh, God, I couldn't be any more excited because like my it works for my brain. Uh, me and a couple guys I met through the podcast. Gotta love podcasts. Um, we started a construction and development company. And so we've got our first couple of projects. We're working on 10 acres here, you know, five acres there and a couple of homes we're building. And I love this because um, I never have been a fan of wholesales or flips. I, I don't want to buy the property that 30 other people are trying to buy. And I don't like to be rushed. Um, so for me, this is huge for me because we're working on a hundred and it's either going to be 50 homes or 150 townhomes. And, you know, yeah, I mean, that's going to take a while, but, I love it because we get to bring something to life. Like it works for my mind. I, you know, so the, the eventual plan is to go into large scale apartments and, and stuff like that. One of the guys on the team has been doing this for a long time. They're all structural engineers. I'm the sales and marketing arm. So I just talk to investors and then we're looking to build rent to, uh, so we have a property management company. So we build rent, build to rent models and then sell them to portfolios to uh, investors. Because my philosophy is this, there's just not enough out there for everybody right now. So if I can build and I can sell direct to my network and they don't, and the property never has to hit the market, mm -hmm. then we just had a really smooth transaction and everybody's happy. Like my question to you is how many doctors and lawyers are out there that would love to pick up three or four houses and they don't have the time, but if I'm selling directly to them, well then we're good. And so that's what we're working on right now. And then, you know, some stuff on the Airbnb side, but eventually, um, you know, I've, I've toyed around with running a fund in a couple of years. Um, I don't want, like, I've never been the guy to physically, even though I can lay the tile and, and I've done all that and lay brick, I'd rather invest in operators. Like I have really good friends that are syndicators, apartment guys, and I'd rather give them money and let them go do their thing. And I always realized I had an epiphany two years ago that uh, you don't invest in the property, you invest in the jockey. And so if you have a guy like yourself who can make the deal, who can get things done, there are people in this business that are deal makers. And you want to feed those guys money so they can continue to do deals. Yeah. And so that's what I love to do. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting, the talking about the build to, to rent model, um, as real estate's decentralized, right? And we've been talking about this for years that this was coming long before COVID. Um, it does offer an opportunity for those of us that are not at that Uber elite level developer to make investments in these secondary markets where the barrier to entry is not crazy. <laughs> James, <laughs> don't be, get out of our business model. No, no, no. You're hundred percent correct. Dude, dude, dude. You you see what I see, right? Okay. Yeah. I'm here in Texas. You got 15 to 20 builders in, uh, in Austin, right? Alone. Yep. <laughs> it's crazy. My friends live in Tyler, Texas. Are you ready for this? She did 29 million by herself last year as an agent. And they can't keep the homes in there. And it's a market that they have one good builder in. Yep. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the second and third tier markets. And we're going to become number two. And it's going to be less risk. We're going to, the price per lot is going to be less. And we're going to fill the gaps. I always like to look at businesses finding the gaps in the market and then season them. Yeah. So um, without a doubt, the, the, there, there are these opportunities now that are becoming apparent that have been presenting themselves. And as you're, what we're finding as you decentralize from Center City, you get to these kind of outer markets and the legislative burdens are far less. The bureaucratic burdens are far less. The legal risks are far less. You know, to we, we have in, in New York holdings where if you could have the worst tenant the most awful human being on the planet, just a bad actor. You're you're every bit, no exaggeration, forget COVID, because that's a whole nother world of pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're every bit of 12 months, if you're lucky for an eviction, mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. like 18. We have stuff up in Pennsylvania, right, Bex? Yeah. Where we had a bad actor. Yep. Ten days later, the sure. sheriff showed up. You were That's out. Wild. 
10 days. James, you're t- see what's interesting about this, and I always find this funny. What you're talking about in real estate is what nobody talks about. They talk about the sex, the the high profit margins on wholesales, the flipping, the Airbnbs. Do you if you want to, if you and I love to get granular in human psychology and like development and stuff, I think it's hilarious, like how these people think. And if you talk to huge developers, they will only develop in municipalities that will green light projects. And I'm like, but what about this great land over here? Nope, not going to do it. Yep. And so when you hear that, you're like, oh, okay, it's a whole different game, right? Well, we've got this 10 acres up here that's not zoned. The city's like, we just want density. Do whatever you want. They're like, we'll give you the keys to the kingdom. Boom, yep. done. Green light. Literally. Let's go. Yeah. They literally are like, you know what's crazy? This guy's working on this other project uh, outside of Austin. They were going to go build uh, like 80 homes. And the city said this in the meeting. Um, Would y'all consider building 250 townhomes instead? And he goes, what? And they go, well, we just want to double the tax rate in the community. And he goes, all right, sounds good. We're going to make about $16 million. Like, you, you, they're so quick to move, which I get it. But one of the things why I always have on agents from like small cities, because I think it's hilarious because they're crushing it. And I love to piss off the agents that are in like Austin or Dallas. It's like my favorite thing to do. And like, be like oh, he's beating your butt. <laughs> it's like, we think that like you have to be there or you have to be anywhere. Not in the world we live in anymore. No. Mm. My friend right now is in Spain. He's got 57 Airbnbs in Boca Raton and like 150 properties. And he's running it from his Apple watch. It don't matter. We, we've removed it. So the question is, is really do your homework. If you're, if any in real estate investors out there, go talk to the cities, go see who wants development, read the tea leaves, read where everybody's at, talk to people. Perfect example. There's a town up here, North of Austin, and it's nobody, they don't even have a Walmart. They don't even have the, the grocery store is a tractor supply right now. Yeah. But there, but there's nine neighborhoods going in. And I went and talked to some of the, the residents and I'm like, where are y'all from? And they're like, downtown Austin. They're like, we're so happy. I'm like, well, there you go. Let's start looking for land. Like, yep. you know, yep. and, but 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 that's not what people want to do because they want to show up. I've never had the the large capital. That a, that a developer. So I always have to try to think like, what's what's five years from now? Like, where are we going to go? And what's not being talked about, right? Because I have friends that are in Indiana, Louisville, Kansas City, uh, Indianapolis. It's blowing up in yep. those markets right now. And so if it's blowing up there, I can only imagine what it's like in Wisconsin, Chicago, you know, Philly, Virginia, North, like one of, North Carolina is a huge market for us moving in the next year. Like North Carolina is a big market. And so you really have to study more of the metrics of the economic investment than just the actual investment itself. And you can really get ahead of the game. Yeah, there's there's no doubt about it. I mean, Bex, we've literally been talking about this for three, four years now. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, Austin, you end up, though, again, back in that spot where. I, I see it clear as day. My gift is vision and deal making. I sure. see all of it, right? And I see how to get there. Um, and I'm a deal maker at heart. But what's holding you back? You know what's holding me back? Honestly, um, goals that have been set on me by mm-hmm. everybody else around me that I've taken sure. on as my own. Completely my fault. Obviously, I carved my own path, but. You know, you you end up sitting there going, I got a lot here. I've, you know, I've done a lot of work in this space, right? Do I really want to kind of pick up and 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 go try something in a different space? Like we've, you know. It, here's the thing about this, and if don't hang around me too much, James, because there's <laughs> there, there's a couple things that are going to happen. Either you move to Europe, or you disappear for three months. You leave your job. You move. If you meet me, I like to shake it up. I actually think that new energy, that new challenge will change your entire life. I get it where you are in your life and you're like, man, I really don't want to start over, but you're not starting over. You're elevating to the next level. There's two different ways to look at it. And that new figure, that new challenge is going to, it's going to drive you. And man, you're going to feel, you're going to feel like you're 32 again. 
yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not short on energy, even kind of in this comfort zone, if you will, that we're in. And we like to think of ourselves as pioneers and all the wonderful things we like to call ourselves in, in our <laughs> market and in our industry. But um, there's no shortage of energy for me, at least like uh, and I'm, I'm I've got a really well-rounded retail background. I've done a ton of ground leasing. I've done a, a ton of infill leasing. Uh, I've done I used to build homes when you were talking about it earlier. Uh, earlier in my career. And you know why I stopped doing it? Because the local market felt I was competing with them. And as yeah. a broker, I couldn't build. And as a builder, I couldn't broker. So, yeah. you know, I stepped away from something I really did enjoy. And I was good at because I didn't want to have that conflict. Um, you know, we just did a, a building uh, up in PA. And the building's got electric, the building's got plumbing, the building's got a new foundation and footings built 2000 square feet, 2,100 square feet, literally walked into the DOB. Becca sent me the application, right? And I, I kind yeah. of looked at her and I'm like, what is this? So like, where's the rest of the paperwork? I got to get this in. <laughs> and she's like, no, that's not, no, that's the paperwork. It was one page, <laughs> one page. We walked in Friday, $357 approved, walked out yeah. with just drawings from online that the builder sent over, no crazy CAD drawings, none of that mess. <laughs> Put start the billing starts going up. Oh, we need a controlled inspection. Call, hey, can we get a controlled? I swear to you, we put the phone away, grabbed the sandwich and the inspectors there. Yep, everything looks good, right? Approved. Yep. There's a whole nother world out there and it is so difficult to move things forward here that if you have had some success here, and you can kind of get through the grind. We have one project. We've been in a local office for three years. And like, yep. we know everybody. And it's the right project. But three years, mm -hmm. we can't get out of the local office. Yeah. You know, we can go do projects that are five times the size of that in other, other locations and meet new people and play a part of shaping a landscape and developing a town and... There's some cool things out there that I, you know, I, I definitely want to explore and, and I've, I've got a, I'm going to come sit on your couch for a little bit. So, <laughs> cool. Let's do it. We, uh, you know, the name of the company is 2M Construction. And I asked, uh, I asked the, the civil engineer why he named it that. And he said that the, the problem is, is all the builders are focused on high end custom or, you know, a, a commute, government affordability. And what's missing is middle America. Yeah. And, and so long story, I try not to confuse everybody, but we have two separate products where we do regular stick builds, but we're bringing to market uh, pods and panels and we can build in 30 days, a single family house. And so what we're trying to get back to is we're trying to get back to middle America, being able to afford a starter home in a nice community that's safe and giving them a product that they can be proud of and, it's really something where I think we've lost sight of because what's interesting is when I, when I weighed out here in the development, <laughs> I used to work private equity for lending money to these guys. So I've been around it for a couple of years, but uh, it's amazing how many criminals there are out there. And I'll, and I'll say the word criminals. Oh, they yeah. are, they are pure on greedy criminals. Mm -hmm. And I, I told my guys, my owners and my company, I said, you know, what would be a revolutionary business model. And I think that y'all probably operate the same way if I had to guess. What if we were nice people? Yes. I mean, what if we actually did what we say we're going to do? What an amazing business model. And they're like, right? oh, my God, that would be so crazy. Right? Yep. <laughs> I mean, I know it sounds oh, so ridiculous it. for me to say it, but it's the truth. It's so like, true. It's so true. And it's mm -hmm. wild to me. You know, and somebody was making a joke the other day, the market's so hot that pilots are coming out of retirement and building houses. And it's the truth. Everybody and their mother's a builder right now. And we, you have to be really careful who you're contracting, make sure they know what they're doing, make sure they have your best interests at heart so you don't get caught because it can happen, man. I've been hearing some stories, so you really need to be careful. So a little advice for folks out there, okay? No disrespect to your local dentist or your local pediatrician. But when your local dentist and your local pediatrician is building your home, get out of the market. Get out. That's a telltale sign, man. I'm telling you, it sounds yep. simple, yeah. but that's one of the things that when we see this, every time we see this cycle come and go, we go, oh, 
<laughs> time to pick up sticks because mm-hmm. it's a cycle, right? Yeah. That's what no, happens. 100%. Oh. I do want to, I do want to give everybody this. So a book that changed my life, I probably bought it 60 times for everybody I meet um, that can really change the way that you mindset. Everything is what you say when you talk to yourself. 13 bucks on Amazon. It talks about 80% of your thoughts and your actions are controlled by your subconscious mind. And if you have bad programming, then you have bad actions. So actually the way to change is to change your programming. So Austin, you do one-on-one coaching. You also do some online stuff. Can you talk a little bit about the differences there and what's the best way for folks to get a hold of you? So you can go to austinlinney.com, L-I-N-N-E-Y is, is a great place. has all the podcasts and everything. Instagram, you can hit me up on Instagram. I'll respond to everybody's DMs. Um, but yeah, I do one-on-one coaching is, is my main business. And, uh, you know, we meet once a week. And then um, I'm getting into the group coaching a little bit because some people ask me. Um, it's my first group. We're testing it out. And uh, we're going to see how that goes. But I, I love my one-on-one coaching Um you know, I, I found that a lot of people just don't have people in their corner, you know, and it's really nice to be in somebody's corner. And and when I'm in, like I'm all in and, you know, it's 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 a delicate dance with the coaching and, and, and being in somebody's life. But, man, it's so great to see them succeed. And and you know what's you know, what's the greatest thing is and I tell this and I'll, I've, I don't think I've ever shared this on a podcast. I tell all my clients, I'm not coaching you. I'm coaching your kids and your spouse, because if I make you better, it's going to make you a better husband and your kids are going to know and your wife's going to be happier. And when the coaching client's wife DMs me and is like, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's when I know I did a good job. That's awesome. This was a a great chat. I'll be there at about 445. (laughs) Dude, hey, let's do it, man. It's a little warm here right now. I might have to come up to you, but yeah. (laughs) <laughs> good stuff man uh, uh congratulations on all the success you've got a remarkable story we were looking forward to this one and uh you know maybe we'll cross paths in some of these municipalities in the future i do i gotta come up i i've been meaning so i, I put on events from time to time i owe new york a visit so bad uh i'm so in trouble with so many investors so uh <laughs> i gotta get up there this fall and we're going to throw an event in New York and we're going to turn it up. Awesome. Make sure let you, you let me know. Cause I'd love to, uh, to come out and support and, and catch up with you. Perfect. Thanks guys. All right, man. Austin Thank Linney, you. everybody, as always, we appreciate the support, the comments. It's been a, a crazy ride and, and we're having a hell of a time with it. So as always, uh, everyone out there, please stay safe.